Remember Laserdisc? No? Me neither. I'd heard of them, but never seen one, as the format was extremely rare in Europe. Until I went to Japan about five years ago. It's got this reputation as being a country of the future, and yes, there's technology everywhere. Some of it pretty cutting edge, but you're just as likely to find fax machines, toaster ovens, punch cards, floppy disk, and indeed laser disk. In Osaka, Japan's second largest city, a giant megaopolis of epic overpasses and neon lights, laser discs are even today readily available. In Denden Town, the city's electronics and Aku Haven, laser discs line shelves alongside VHS and DVDs. I was over there to work as an English teacher, but in my spare time, I wandered around the, multi the multitudinous alleyways, subways, and high streets, exploring, walking, drinking sake one cups, and eating takwasa and goiza at all hours. In the district of Denden Town, also known as Nippambashi, there were plenty to interest the western tourist. Maid cafes with young women in sobre cosplay serving tea from bone china teapots in response to the delicate little bells placed on each table, multi-story manga and anime stores with seven-foot-tall Gundams guarding the doorway, I even remember a strange unmarked doorway, the only information on the sign outside being a colorful drawing of an angry carrot with muscular arms wearing high heels and stockings. I never stepped through that door and I probably never will. Another thing you need to know about Japan as a whole, and Osaka in particular, is that it has a homeless problem. There seems to be no support structure for all people with social problems, unemployment, poverty, drug dependency, not even an attempt to sweep them out at night. Alongside many roads, under bridges, on traffic islands, and even city parks, people are living in tents, bivacs, and semi-permanent shacks or sheds. Some of these guys are in terrible condition. I once saw an old man step out of his roadside shack in bare feet. His toes and toenails so mangled they look like broken bones sticking out of stumpy raw flesh. Others are fairly well dressed, like salarymen down on their luck. Even Oshkawa Cohen, the grounds of Oshka's famous castle, where Tagwa defeated the Dajomi in 1615 established the 250 year dominance of the Tagwa, has inhabited shacks and tarplins strung up between the cherry blossoms. Despite the number of people living homeless, it's extremely rare to see anyone begging or even busking for change. For that reason, it drew my attention when one night while out walking in Nikashami Cohen, Cohen means park, I saw what appeared to be a rudimentary store. Outside a tiny wooden hut of scrap wood and metal, not big enough for one person to lie down in, sat an elderly bearded man in disgusting clothing. On his feet, he wore plastic bags from 7-Eleven and in front of him, laid on the ground on a square piece of tarp, was in a random array of scrounged old tattered up garbage. I glanced across as I continued walking. It had passed midnight, but in places like Oska, that means very little. Restaurants and shops were still open, and the park was full of life. Besides the homeless people, there was also the drunk salarymen sleeping off of skin full of sake, the young lovers and the practicing musicians. Because of the flimsy nature of walls in Japanese apartments, a couple wanting time to themselves can actually find more privacy in a public park than they can at home. As I continued my walk, I saw a young man practicing drums. He had set up a full kit with bass drums, snare, toms, hi-hat, the whole lot, and was bashing away on the grass under the heavy loaded through thru of the cherry blossoms. I walked around the path, doubling back on myself and headed back the way that I came. I was getting tired and I had to be up early, but I was enjoying the sights and the moonlight. As I had walked past the old homeless man for the second time, we accidentally made eye contact. Just for a second, and we both looked down at his arrangement of objects. I walked over to where he sat and stood before him. My Japanese was rather poor, so when he spoke, I couldn't make any of it out, partially due to my lack of fluency, but it was also the 
teeny croaky spoken, a fast staccato of an overstimulated Geiger counter. I tried to mumble a few words in Japanese, but soon settled with, sorry, I don't understand. Sale. Ito cheap, he said, and pointed to one item that appeared to be a bundle of short electrical cables with the two pin plugs still attached. The appliances they once served were nowhere to be seen. Gai Hakun! 500 yen, I'd figured. About five American dollars. Two pounds and fifty pence British. He pointed to another item, a rubber ampermans doll's head which looked like it had been run over by a car. Gai Hakun! A stained, wrinkled, softcore porn magazine, the cover starring a young Japanese lady with painted lips and a black bikini. Gai Hakun! A hubbub from a Toyota. Gai Hakun! A carrier bag, 7-Eleven, containing a small pile of partially smoked cigarettes. Gai Hakuen! A dead bird. Gai Hakuen! A sodden pair of trousers looking like they had recently been fished out of one of Osaka's many rivers. Gai Hakuen! A 12 inch by 12 inch cardboard square sleeve with a disc inside. Gai Hakuen! I bent over to get a closer look. The cardboard had once been white, but it had clearly been soaked and dried out once or twice and stored in damp conditions. It was wrinkled and peeled and scuffed with filth. In a corner, I could make out the image of three eggs in a line, the initials NHK written across them, the logo for Japan's public broadcasting station. I picked it up and turned it over. On the back was some faded handwritten kanji, which I had no chance of deciphering, and the katakana, alufu. I tipped the sleeve sideways and let the disc clip out in my hand, and up to that point, I had expected to see a shiny blackness of vinyl. Instead, I saw the silver of laser disc catching the street light, shimmering veins of electric blue like motor oil on water. Even so, there was a significant scratching and the odd patch where the aluminum surface had peeled revealing the plastic underneath. I didn't know what the disc was, and I wasn't convinced it would play at all, but it was significantly curious, and the old guy obviously needed the money. I paid him a 500 yen coin and thanked him too politely. Thank you. Domo arigato gosmasu. He bowed his head a little, and I set off walking. The laser disc tucked under my arm. A few hundred feet away, I heard him muttering and yelping, and when I glanced back, I saw that he was looking in my direction. I couldn't exactly understand what anything that he had said, and the wind blew gently, taking his words away into the treetops and a high-res apartment blocks, and the light polluted night sky. I didn't own a Laserdisc player, so the disc was forgotten for a couple of weeks. It spent some time on the coffee table, on the ground underneath the sofa, propped up beside the TV, anywhere it could be ignored. I had no intention of ever doing anything with it, and certainly wasn't going to buy a Laserdisc player just to find out that the disc was damaged beyond repair. An American friend of mine was over one day and he noticed the disc. He asked about it and I told him that how I had acquired it. He agreed it looked unlikely to play and also couldn't read the handwritten kanji on the sleeve, but said he knew a Japanese technical expert with the equipment and know-how to potentially possibly salvage it. He contacted him and a couple of days later, he was available, we visited him at his apartment. Now, most living rooms have the usual stuff, seating, TV, dining table, etc. But in this apartment, the living room was full of sound and video equipment, computers, digital and analog, tape decks, wires stretching and tangling everywhere, monitor screens and speakers and stacks. He took one look at the laser disc and agreed that there really wouldn't be much surviving data but what was there he could try and salvage. He had a high-end player called Muse High Vision, which he said could read through defects that a normal player couldn't. That ran through a processing amplifier into a capture card in one of his many PCs and the specialist software it contained. He told us that he would need time to clean it up and encode it, and we should leave him to it as it would be extremely boring to watch. We agreed and went to a nearby bar for a few beers and a couple of rounds of yakitori, grilled skewers of different parts of chicken, breast, neck, crispy skin, meatballs, heart, liver, cartilage. It's honestly great beer food. Our technical expert friend knew where we were and he said that he'd be around to collect us when he'd finished. A couple of hours later, when we were nicely drunk and our bellies were full, we began wondering if he would be in much longer. Just as my friend was about to make the call, our technical expert was suddenly standing there beside our table. His face was white and gaunt. Whiter and gaunter than you would expect from someone with such a dedication to digital technology. 
and he placed a laser disc with the sleeve and a black DVD box on the table. Without saying anything, he turned to leave. My friend and I looked at each other, and we grabbed the techie sleeve with the wait. Despite his reluctance, we got him to sit with us and had a drink brought over to him. He drank quickly like he couldn't wait to be out of there and wouldn't answer any questions about what he had found on the disc. He said all that was on there was an AVI stored in the DVD and that we should just take it and go. He repeatedly warned us off to watching it. He deleted it from his computer and we would be well advised to destroy both discs and forget about them. I asked him if he could read the scrawled kanji from the laserdisc sleeve. It means nothing, he said. Nothing he could understand anyway. He said it was like an ancient character set and compared it to me trying to decipher old English written in the densest gothic script. He didn't want payment for his work, he just wanted to forget about it. But I managed to force three 1,000 yen notes into his hand. He thanked me repeatedly, graciously bowing his head, and asked pathetically if he could go now. We said sure, and he got up and basically ran out the door without another word. At this point, we couldn't understand his reaction at all. He was either very eccentric and a nervous man normally, or he had really truly seen something terrible and unsettling that he was struggling to come to terms with. We, of course, had had a few drinks, so we dismissed him as a weirdo and laughed about it. But in retrospect, I know his behavior had been understandable. In fact, I think I, he held it together well just by bringing the disc to us. If I, had been in, if I had been in his position, I may have disappeared from contact, turned off my phone and ignored the doorbell until he went away. I may have called the police and reported us for suspicion of committing insane and terrible crimes. I may have babbled and drooled my way into a secure mental institution where I could bang my head against soft walls until I died old and alone except for the insects in my mind and underneath my skin. Soon we left the bar, excited to get back to my apartment and watch the disc. And much to my regret, that's exactly what we did. With a few cans of chuha to keep the drinking mood going, I struck the unlabeled DVD into the drive of my laptop. There was one file on the disc. A .avi file with a random alphanumeric name, something like 000a5h4.avi. I double clicked it and full screened the video. It troubles me to think back to what we saw. Those terrible sights that sobered us up and kept us from finishing our drinks. That has kept sleep away for most of the last five years and effectively ruined our friendship. That ruined our night and troubled our lives. Regardless, I will try to remember all that I saw of that video. A disgusting nightmare version of what appeared to be the lost finale episode of the 1980s American family sitcom, Elf. The conclusion to the cliffhanger in which we saw him captured by the alien task force. The video began with a loud, high-pitched squealing sine wave tearing through our ears. On screen was a test card pattern, vertical bands of bright color on the top half, blocks of black white and gray at the bottom. This remained on screen for about a minute, occasionally broken up by pixelated blocks of digital distortion, the whole while accompanied by this high-pitched sine wave. Suddenly nothing. A black screen in silence. After a wait, which felt like minutes, but could have easily just been seconds, the screen flickered like an old video cassette, presumably from an earlier analog digital transfer, and still the occasional explosions of digital distortion from the corrupted laser disc. The NHK logo began fading into the black background but suddenly glitched out. The screen breaking up into pixelated blocks and shouting out would burst of white noise that disappeared as quickly as it appeared. What remained on the flickering screen was a view down of a dirty, dim-lit corridor. The floors and walls appeared tilted like some sort of hospital, but filthy and damaged everywhere as though it had been in the scenes of floods and massacres. Most of the lights were out and the ones that worked flickered intermittently. The only sound was the occasional electronic buzz of the lights, almost too quiet to perceive. All down the corridor, into the distance, were double hospital doors with small windows at an eye level. A quiet, pathetic whimper or groan of pain or defeat emerged slowly from the electronic buzz. A tearful sobbing of someone reduced to helplessness by torture and humiliation. Suddenly, digital distortion ripped away the image and brought back with the camera moving down the corridor and screaming guttural roars. Someone in one of the rooms was evidently being subjected to a heinous ordeal which words couldn't express, only the screams of un un only the scream of unenthusiasm, cutting and tearing. 
Up until this point, we had been fairly good-humored about the video, but something about the screaming and sobbing unsettled us. This wasn't the sound of acting, but more like the sound of real agony. The sound of someone or something being maimed and mauled by hands trained in the art of cruelty. As the camera continued down the corridor and the screaming grew worse and worse, the other voices joined in. Various desperate calls and screams and a range of pitches and bizarre alien languages tore out, as if it was beings in prisons in the room leading off from the corridor. They howled in response to the pain of their fellow inmate. The screens built and built to a crescendo, and the flickering video distortion worsened to the point where the picture was completely obscured. And just as the noise was so bad I thought I would cry, more digital distortion and white noise ripped through everything. The picture returned with an image that shocked us, made us cry out in horror and surprise and almost an absurd burp of laughter. The chorus of screams were silenced and the image on screen was so unexpected to us. The, the collision of the familiar childhood image with such unspeakable viciousness a contradicting that broke our minds. Filling the screen was Alf, the alien life form from the TV series of the same name. The shot was close up, showing his head and shoulders from above as he lay strapped to a stainless steel dissection table. White light poured down on him from out of shot, making the image stark and overexposed, even though even through the flicker of the worn out video. He lay with his hand to, head to one side, his fur matted with dark blood and various wires and electrodes penetrating the top of his head. He sobbed gently. His pain was unbearable. Genuine suffering which made, a, made a, which made us desperate to reach out and help a fellow living creature out. His expression of pain was both human and animal. He began to turn his head. The effort was clearly about as much as he could muster, and after a few failed attempts and tired whimpers, he faced the camera with closed eyes. More digital distortion and white noise than... Then Alf opened his eyes. Beaten and bloodshot, strangely human eyes as though a person were trapped beneath the house skin. He tried to speak. Please. I, I, I miss you. He croaked. I, I miss you. His words were translated into Japanese subtitles. And as a title, the word Alf in big white letters of that familiar font and the Katakana Japanese subtitles translations appeared on the screen, Alf let out a horrendous blood curdling scream. Out of breath and panting and screaming and screaming until his voice was hoarse and he could scream no more. But still, between sobs and desperate gasps for breath, he screamed and screamed and screamed. He stared into the camera with those teared up, dying, pleated eyes staring at us. At me. As he screamed and screamed. This must have gone on for at least a few minutes, at least, and just when we thought we couldn't take any more of this, just when the constant screaming was eating away at our very minds, the terrible saxophone music started. We couldn't believe it. Along with the continued screams, that saxophone-led theme song from the third and fourth seasons of ALF began to play. It was that same music, but somewhat raw as if it was pushed through overloaded speakers and re-recorded into a wax cylinder, and then blasted out again in ear-splitting volumes. And between interspersed cuts of jolly scenes from the past, shots of the Tanner family, credits starring Max Wright and Schneid, and random clips of analog and digital distortion increasing in severity, all the time were images of terrible torture. A close-up of a hand being drilled, a lid being hobbled with a sledgehammer, and all the while that hideous screaming and panting and crying. The quality of the footage was deteriorating still, and as the happy memories and torture and miserable wails and distortion of the saxophone music and white noise cars played, I began to feel sick. All those terrible experiences built up to a roar, and suddenly the video jumped and stuck on a loop, a split second of smiling Willie Tanner with starring Max Wright and blazing across. A full body shot of Alf strapped to the tabletop and his torso peeled open, revealing the bleeding, beating insides of his alien anatomy. Those two hideous images jumping, cutting, looping between each other at irregular intervals. All the while the screaming, the white noise, the distorted, lumping sac saxophone music stuck, stuck, stuck. And I swear under all of that clamor I could hear the maniacal laughter of Alf himself. 
Those two images looped for so long that I began to think it was an actual that the actual AVI was skipping somehow, but checking it, I saw the VLC time slider moving along normally. The looping continued until more serious distortion obliterated all sound and visuals, replacing them with pixelated blocks and indistinguishable noise. When the picture returned, it was that of a lower quality, but and the scene had changed. The camera, now camcorder quality, seemed to be lying silently over its side on the table looking, tabletop looking across the room to the autopsy table where Alf, where Alf laid strapped down. The lighting was dim and a green tinge to the picture suggested night vision. The scene was obscured by someone stepping in front of the camera. A person in a doctor's scrubs, gloves, and apron were all heavily stained with blood and feces. They adjusted the camera slightly and stepped back out of shot. Alf, who may have been lying unconscious, seemed to have come to and began mumbling and whimpering and begging. No. No. Please. 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 No. His head moving side to side slightly. He appeared delirious, distressed, and barely alive. The doctor walked back into shot and stood with his back to the camera beside Alf and the autopsy table. His features were covered in a gray surgeon's hat and a face mask. He stood over Alf, looking down on him and appeared to be talking. We couldn't hear a word he said, just the occasional calm constant penetrating through Alf's sobbing and pleading, and the slight move movements of head and shoulders. The scene remained unchanged, except for the persistent random interface of distortion for maybe five minutes. Five minutes of inaudible calm speech. Unchanged, except for the occasional sudden jump cuts to the smiling faces of Kate, Lynn, and Brian Tanner, who seemed to be looking on in curious glee. It was as if though the surgeon, the torturer, was explaining matter-of-factly exactly what he was planning to do to Alf. The sobbing and pleading continued throughout, then a brief flash of distortion and white noise leading suddenly to the blackness. I don't know how long the blackness hair lasted. It may not even it, it may not even been in the video. Perhaps I might have passed out momentarily, or shock had just left a blank hole in my memory. Whatever really happened when the picture came back, the scene had changed yet again. The camera was on the move, held in the hand of someone I presumed to be the surgeon, not pointing at anything but swinging around wildly with the movements of his arm. This was dizzying, producing blurred effects of blood-stained walls and spilled gore like an like an abitur's floor. Soon it steadied and swung around to the autopsy table where lay the mutilated headless corpse of Alf. Jump cut to Kate, Lynn, and Brian in happy conversation. Camera panned along the body and upward toward the ceiling. Towards the source of the athermic drip, drip, drip of dark liquid. There, hanging by cables and wires, was a severed, silent head of Alf. His scalp shaved and ears snipped off to allow access for the multitudinous, for the multinous penetrative electrodes. Below the stump of his neck hung the spine pulled from his body. And although I didn't notice at the time, in retrospect, it occurred to me that there was something extremely wrong. Well, I mean, obviously it was all wrong. I mean, there was something not as you'd expect about their spine. Rather than being the repeating structure of a small separate vertebrae, the spine began at the neck as two long, thin parallel bones which ran half the length and terminated at a joint when, where they connected to a single, thicker bone running down the rest of the way. Thinking back, I have, come, I have become convinced over time that Alf's spine was not exactly a spine, but the bones I saw were the radius, ulna, and humerus of a human arm. As the camera held on the scene for a moment, and the words created by Paul Fusco faded into the screen, Alf's eyes blinked open and he looked directly at the camera. The voice of the camera cameraman sounded. The voice of the surgeon. The voice of Willie Tanner saying, Good morning, Alf. Alf screamed a scream of guttural anguish and the credit sequence rolled. Humorous pictures of Alf drinking from the toilet, trying on glasses, peeking through the blinds, wearing headphones, all that stuff, but instead of the theme tune playing, it was just that screaming, desperate, panting, and crying. Immediately as the video ended, I turned and was sick all over the arm of the sofa under the wall. Sick and sick again. I rested against the arm against the arm trying to recover my strength for a minute or two and eventually looked over at my friend. He sat motionless, mouth clamped shut and eyes wide open and empty. Hands held out in what it could have been a shrug or begging or even praying. I called his name and I didn't get a response. I shook him by the knee and then the shoulder and called his name again and again and again. Suddenly he snapped out of it. 
and a bit of life came back into his eyes. Just a bit. He looked around the room as if wondering where he was and over at me. We looked over at each other, shocked and disbelieving. As I felt the rise of more vomiting, I rushed to the toilet and heaved and spat and sobbed through my mouth and nose. As this was going on, I heard the front door close. When I came out of the bathroom, my friend had gone. So had the laser disc and so had the DVD from my laptop. The disc tray was open and VLC was open to the desktop, but the file was gone. Had I wanted to play it again, which I definitely did not, I wouldn't have been able to. After I cleaned up my vomit, I failed to contact my friend. He wasn't answering his phone. I went to bed and failed to sleep. I lay for hours staring at the ceiling with terrible images running through my mind. At one point, I thought I had heard a voice somewhere in the apartment and managed to back up the courage to investigate and find nobody. I returned to bed with the lights on and drifted off eventually into fits of terrible, indefinable nightmares. I woke up wet with my own urine. Couldn't even remember even having done that before. I didn't hear or see from my friend ever again, and over time we grew even more declined to contact him. Now if I saw him in the streets, I think I would turn and walk the other way for fear of what might happen should our shared memories get together again. Since watching that video, I've suffered from severe sleep disorders and been through therapy to try and quell the constant obsessive repetit repetition of unwanted extreme mental imagery. A few months after watching the video, I returned home to England and hadn't returned to Japan since. Although it was five years ago and 6,000 miles away, I still cannot get away from it. I carry the imagery with me in my head and suspect my old friend does too. I don't know where he is or how he's doing, but last week I received an email headed ALF Autopsy from one of those anonymous temporary accounts. I deleted the email and then proceeded to power down my computer. Boy, oh boy, was this something. And not a good kind of something. Honestly, this story really had a lot of good things going for it. And honest, I, I was really, really hoping that this pasta would at least provide something new and interesting and try and spice up the lost episode genre, but... <sighs> Unfortunately, that just wasn't the case here. Now, normally I would break this story down in the typical kind of way that I tend to do these reviews, but for the sake of this story, I'm going to do something a bit different. Instead of chopping certain parts up of the story into different topics like the protagonist, the pasta, cliches, etc., I'm actually going to be breaking the story down by act. So specifically, Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3 are all going to be giving their own reviews, followed by my final thoughts and, of course, my ratings. So of course, enough beating around the bush, let's actually get to it, shall we? Act 1 of this poster was by far one of the most creative and interesting parts of the story, and I loved every ounce of it. The details in terms of the cities, the homeless people problem in Japan, the nice details regarding Laserdisc, and the meetup between the protagonist and the homeless seller was definitely a nice change of pace when it comes to the typical Lost Episode startup, and I'll even admit that little detail with the carrot and everything was rather nice. I mean, I'm not joking when I say that I was actually able to properly visualize every part of the first act of the story, and it really did a great job putting me in the story. So, I mean, being able to really truly visualize every little aspect of it, it was just amazingly. It was amazing. It was freaking amazing. I loved every ounce of it. It was truly impeccable seeing that. Which, I'll be fair, it's kind of rare to sit there and see in a lost episode crew pasto, so that that right there already gave this some good points. While I certainly, however, can say that the meetup between the protagonist and the homeless man was a little bit close to the typical yard sale crew pasta cliche, at the very least it worked and it was still and it still managed to actually rope me into it. I was genuinely interested to see what was go what was going to go on between the two. And of course with the whole detail with the laser disc and everything like that, it really helped to bring everything together. I mean, even the very startup caught my interest, and that's one thing with many Lost Episode stories that you don't usually get, and that's like actually one of the primary features of any story, is that you always want to have your first sentences be the thing that really wraps you into it and really puts you into the story and takes your interest. And this story manages to do that in the best way possible, and I have to say, it's pretty damn amazing. 
I mean, overall, I can say it's at a great and amazing startup to this pasta and one of my favorite openings to any kind of creepypasta I've honestly read on this channel. And that's really saying a lot. Act 2 at least for the first half of this part, was rather good. The plotline about the protagonist not really thinking too much about the laser disc was kind of a nice and refreshing change of pace, compared to how most protagonists get extremely curious immediately upon soon getting a disc slash VHS tape and immediately go and do whatever it is without really thinking. The added addition as well as the protagonist going to a tech expert to try and salvage the contents of the disc was also extremely impressive in terms of storytelling, detail, and things like that. And the added freaked out reaction from the tech guy as well after he had managed to sit there and salvage the evidence, salvage everything that was on there, was really nice and it added a nice addition to suspense and a bit of tension and curiosity and really had me wondering what was actually on that disc that actually made the guy so creeped out. I mean again in terms of detail and everything else for that matter it was very well done and it was just downright great. I have to be quite honest it's just yeah I <laughs> I gotta say, this was very well done, very well detailed, and just downright amazing for the most part. I have to say that. <sighs> Unfortunately, the second half of the story went completely off of the rails in such a bad way, and destroyed any enjoyability and originality that would have separated the story from any typical Lost episode creepypasta. Now, why is that, you might be asking? Well, to start off, the episode was nothing more than just black screens, random screaming, blood, gore, feces, realism, and an overall lack of anything even remotely new or unique in, an ep in the episode that actually had... I mean, I'm not joking with any of you. I can't really recall too much from this episode. And I remember listening to this from, um, from Gory Parodies Productions. Yeah. No matter how many times I listen to that, no matter how many times I sit there and I actually read the story, nothing about that specific episode sticks. It's the most typical bland lost episode that you could really imagine except with an exceedingly amount of unnecessary detail and reactions. Now I know that I've sat there and I praised the direction and everything and the heavy detail that was included, but that was only because of the fact that it was actually appropriate at that time. Specifically with the details of the landmarks and everything else that went on really helped visualize the story and I'm not saying that it doesn't technically do that with this one, but to be fair even visualizing the episode itself was nothing more but an outright bore. I shit you not, I was actually rolling my eyes so damn hard that I'm honestly surprised that both of them didn't sit there and just pop out of my freaking head from rolling them so much. I mean, look, if, if I could really summarize the entirety of this episode, this is what it would be. The episode involves the aftermath of the episode Consider Me Gone, with Alf strapped down on an operating table, table being tortured with tons of screaming added in, and black screens and spooky noises and everything, and the episode cutting out consistently, randomly, numerous times over and over and over again until ending abruptly. That's pretty much it. There really is no... Any, there really isn't anything else to say. The episode part of the story was just such a major letdown, and that right there is a really grave disappointment for the story. I mean, if it actually had a relatively sensible storyline attached to it, but with a much darker plot, like, I'm not opposed to the idea of there being something similar to that. But, if you're going to go out of your way and do this, don't sit there and have it be like some kind of creepy YouTube poop mashup, which I shit you not, was exactly what you wind up getting with this. Now, sure, I know that there are some people that are probably going to say, well, this was probably created by some company or whatever to mess around or something like that, but I'm not going to go out of my way and buy that mess for this specific reason. If you're going to ultimately use that attempt or even an excuse to try and justify the unnecessary bullcrap that came with this, with how this episode was made, then sorry to say that just doesn't work. Look, I'm going to be frank here, 
The best way to sit there and work with this is to sit there and have a sensible storyline plot to it. Perhaps maybe have an entire series and plot line that actually does involve, like say, the alien task force, things like that. What actually happened afterwards? Have like an actual storyline to go with it, but have it be extremely dark and fucked up. I mean, you could sit there and still keep the autopsy part. And again, it can still work out and be extremely messed up. And it could actually be properly explained on that end that this was originally what the ending was supposed to be, but it was rejected by studios for obvious reasons like the extremely dark, fucked up nature, you know, with Alf basically being dissected. It could have definitely went into an extremely heavy level of creativity with it. This was quite literally the best form of potential, the 100% potential capability of coming up with something so exceedingly creative something that quite literally could still be creepy but at the same time be exceedingly enjoyable for a story that really managed to catch my attention and everything with this pasta sitting there and actively having to sit to read this part Consistently listening to it is nothing more but a big snore fest, a wasted capability, a wasted potential, and it's just so damn boring. That's the worst part about this episode, the episode part. It's exceedingly boring. There's nothing about this pasta, in terms of episode-wise that is, that really has anything sticking out with it. It's nothing more than just a typical YouTube poop style lost episode story. And I'll even go out of my way and say it's a lot worse than even the typical lost episode story. Why is that, you might be asking? Because even with many god-awful lost episode stories with hyper-realistic cards, things like that being thrown in, at the very least, at the very least, some of those stories do actually manage to come up with a storyline to it. It's not very common, but it still happens. And even though those stories are absolute dog shit, this, at the very least, they at least come up with somewhat of a story, no matter, regardless of how typical many of them are. This one just doesn't have that. Now, maybe there is a better explanation that could be put into it, but unfortunately, that just doesn't happen. And you know what? I'm going to combine both Act 2 and Act 3 in this part here because there's no reason to cut out to another part here i'm just gonna flat out say it <sighs> the worst aspect about this is not only just be just the terrible episode of its own right being thrown in it's the fact that we could have genuinely gotten something exceedingly original creepy and yet at the same time enjoyable but we didn't the only thing i can genuinely say that I can genuinely say that was actually extremely creative was the inclusion of instead of the spine on Alf after his severed head was well there instead of that it was actually the details of an arm which of course was a rather interesting little touch but that's really the only creative thing I can actually say about this and to be fair I can't even really use it as much of a positive because to be fair, that's only just one small, tiny ounce of creativity being thrown into this mess of an episode. Look, and I wouldn't have so much of a problem with this episode if it at least had an actual proper explanation behind why that was the case. Maybe there was something more to this specific episode. Maybe this could have actually just been a jumbled up, messed up, screwed up, you know, part that actually wasn't the full episode. Maybe the full episode itself could have been much, much longer. But of course, despite everything that I'm honestly trying to say here, it definitely could have gone on a lot better than that, than what we have been provided. And to be fair, I just... Not really much else to say. Now, of course, for Act 3... Act 3 was extremely flat. There really wasn't too much else more to say other than just simply that. The protagonist gets exceedingly sick, like how many lost episode protagonists go. The friend leaves. They have absolutely no talking with one another. They sit there and they lose their friendship with one another, all because of a weird, creepy episode of ALF. And of course, the protagonist gets an email and all that, and that's about it. To be fair, there's really not too much else to really say about this. 
I mean, you'd think that something like this would have at least a little bit of a better story, backstory along the lines, or maybe, maybe the protagonist could have gone out of their way and taken a little bit of extra time to try and um, answer some of the necessary questions that the story opened up. I mean, while I definitely have gone out of my way and I've raved a little bit about, well, I've sat there and I've gone out of my way and I've criticized the story, specifically the, the episode part, a lot, the third act could have really gone out of its way and provided a better quality or at least an example or a reasoning behind why the episode was the way that it was. I mean, perhaps maybe some people could probably say that it's because of the laser disc itself, but let's be completely sincere here. If that was the case with the laser disc, which I <clears throat> I am willing to go out of my way and say that could likely be the case. Maybe the disc is corrupted in some way, shape, or form, or... But to be fair, that seems extremely unlikely. Minus the distortion and everything that the episode itself had, it... Judging by the length, this definitely does seem like some kind of, like a 10 minute sequence of sort. I mean, maybe there were a few scenes probably cut out to a degree, and I do know that there was in part one part that was kind of muted to a degree. I am willing to go out of my way and believe that. However, it still doesn't exactly excuse the way that the episode went out. Again, if this had genuinely been a, a storyline plot or something like that, maybe corrupted to some degree and screwed up to a degree, it would have been a lot more explainable to. It would have definitely been... <sighs> Basically, what I'm trying to say is this. If it had ultimately had a relatively good storyline added up to it, with, of course, some glitches and screws and screw-ups and everything because of the corruption of the laser disc, that would have been a better explanation. But, again, we don't get that, and instead, like I've said before, protagonist vomits, friend leaves, email comes in, nothing more. Now, with that being stated, I'm gonna go out of my way and just give my conclusion, too. Because why not combine all of it? This was a story that genuinely started off rather amazingly and very, very promising. And, of course, it quite literally just went downhill. It went about as down downhill as quickly as it started. Okay, maybe not as quickly, but definitely within the second half of the, of the second act. Not good. I certainly, however, will credit the author for really going into a great level of detail with world building and the like. Especially with the very first startup, it was downright beautiful and genius to make it that part. But the rest of it just felt like nothing more than a typical Lost Episode pasta. And I understand that Lost Episode creepy pastas are not exactly the easiest things to write. I mean, I should know. I've written a fair share of them and many of them are complete shit. I mean, I'm not trying to go after the author for this. But I do think that this definitely could have gone with a little bit more brainstorming, perhaps. Or maybe just a little bit of time to sit on it, perhaps, maybe? But still, not exactly the best Lost episode in the world. It's not a terrible story, it's definitely in a pretty enjoyable read for what it's worth, minus all the issues that the story does have. And of course, with that stated, this is my final, my final um, rating. I'm going to give this story a 4 out of 10. The very first startup of the act and even the second part of the secondary of the second act were amazingly well done, very well heavily detailed, and just very believable. Unfortunately, that's about as much as I am going to give it because the rest of the story completely falls flat. And when your actual episode and the and the ending itself completely fall flat, completely, there's just nothing else more to really say. Again, this could have definitely been much, much better, but that's that's really all I have to say. But like I always say with these stories, and like what I always will continue to say, this is simply my own personal opinion, and if you disagree with it, that's perfectly fine too. We're all entitled to our own opinions in regards to these greedy pastas, and this is simply my own personal thoughts. What did you guys think about this greedy pasta? Did you guys enjoy it? Did you guys not? And also. <laughs> Out. In fear and surprise, as your eyes widen, your mouth goes dry with each battered breath. 
You try to scream, your mind begs to be glued to your computer screen. The killers they slash, the tapes burn and crash. The cartridge you bought will be your final haunt. The rituals of hate will seal your fate. The tears you shed will be from the fear gripping portrait that marriage your fill. Terrorizing, hateful, burning, violent, rage inducing, knife slashing, blood splattering, silent screams. Only time will tell if you will escape this online hell. Your horror filled obsessions will come with its own regressions. Your pathetic screams will not be heeded in any way. Because your nightmares will come at any day